Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at munitions and clothing production, railways and shipbuilding, and shipping and overseas trade. We hear now from Dr Christina Robert about the production of clothing, uniforms and boots. My name is Christina Robert. I'm originally from Hungary. I teach at the University of Roehampton in West London. My main area of interest is the First World War, written in the First World War in particular. The paper that I've given here at the conference at St. Andrews has been about army uniforms in 1914-1915. When the First World War breaks out, you would think that clothing would be the last thing upon people's minds, but that's not the case. One of the first things that happens when war is declared is that there is a huge dislocation of trade. Trading stops between enemy countries and that affects people involved in the production of clothing very badly. A lot of women, for example, lose their jobs because they were employed as seamstresses, milliners, feather makers. These so-called luxury trades shut down because a lot of middle-class people in Britain very patriotically immediately cancel their orders. They think they have to economise. In addition, you lose a lot of orders from abroad. So the British tailoring trade, the British bootmaking trade, the textile trades, orders are cancelled very quickly from Germany, from Austria, which are now enemy countries. Also, orders which you have delivered already are now not paid from these countries. So there is a great deal of concern about unemployment in the clothing trade, in the textile trades, I have looked at some local newspapers at the time. The textile means in Yorkshire, for example, the Leeds tailoring industries. There are a lot of companies which are on half time or had to shut down because they simply have no orders. This is why the phrase business as usual becomes very important. The patriotic thing in Britain is to keep British trade going. They say, please renew your order because if you're cancelling your business, the trades will suffer, there will be unemployment, there will be economic distress. As soon war breaks out and Lord Kitchener becomes Secretary of State for War, one of the main contributions that he made towards the British war effort is recognising that this is going to be a longer war, at least three years, and that Britain has to expand its army massively. Britain is the only country in 1914 that did not have conscription. All European armies were conscripted. Britain has a very small army, 250,000 men, mainly garrisoning the empire, recruited through voluntary recruitment. So between the beginning of August 1914 and early 1915 is this massive effort to create mass new armies, the so-called Kitchener's new armies. You have to put these men into uniforms, so you have to think about uniform production. The British Army has a well-set-up system for producing uniforms before the outbreak of the war, but that is only producing uniforms for 250,000 men, which is tiny. Before the mid-19th century, uniform procurement was basically a byword for corruption. In 17th, 18th and early 19th centuries, it's the colonel of the regiment whose responsibility and right it is to clothe his troops. And this is also a source of income because you can save quite a lot of money if you don't spend all the money that you're supposed to spend on your troops' uniforms. You have troops wearing very poor quality, shoddy uniforms, which affects their health, their fighting capacity, and of course are usually making a nice tidy sum. This is pretty standard even during the Crimean War. And it gets so bad that after the Crimean War, One area of reform is uniform procurement. New departments in the War Office are created, the Royal Army Clothing Department and the Army Contracts Department, and they are going to be responsible 
for supplying uniforms to the British Army. The Royal Army Clothing Department is a military supply department of the War Office, which from 1899 will be subsumed under the Ordnance Corps. It has its own clothing factory, which starts in 1863 in Pimlico, the famous Pimlico Army Clothing Factory. A lot of people know the Dolphin Square Apartments. That is actually on the site of the former Pimlico Army Clothing Factory, which was demolished in 1933. By the end of the 19th century, the Pimlico factory produces uniforms for most army units. It's so successful that it swallows up other sides which had produced uniforms for other units of the army. There was one in Woolwich, there was one in Westminster, so those become incorporated. Despite being a model factory, very good working conditions, good wages, one hour for lunch, separate cloakrooms, dining rooms and toilet facilities for the women workers, which is very exceptional. It only produces 50% of the uniforms that the army needs. The other 50% was purchased by the army contracts department from civilian clothing manufacturers. The idea was that state production of uniforms in order to maintain quality and cost effectiveness should have some competition and this competition was provided by purchasing the other 50% of uniforms from civilian producers. One of the main duties of the Army Contracts Department is to keep the costs down and make sure that there is no corruption. It regularly compares the cost price of uniforms at the Pimlico Clothing Factory, as well as the civilian army contractors. In 1887, there is an investigative commission, the Morley Commission, investigating the Pimlico Factory. They established that the factory is producing good quality, it's cost-effective, but nevertheless the commission argues that the civilian contractors should be maintained because it's helping to maintain production quality and cost-effectiveness. Responsibility for purchasing uniforms is divided between army contracts and the army clothing department requirements and the specifications for how many uniforms, what kind of uniform, that's identified by the Army Clothing Department. But the invitation to tender and the selection of the companies, negotiating the price and placing the contracts, that's done by the Army Contracts Department. The Army Contracts Department was created to be responsible for all procurement, for all supplies for the War Office, and to monitor the price to make certain that it's cost-effective. The Army Contracts Department invites companies, reliable companies, to tender. The offers are open all at the same time. And then the Army Clothing Department and the Contracts Department decide which are the most reliable reputable and cost-effective companies and they get the tender. Before the war in 1913-1914, the annual production of service jackets worn by the other ranks was about 250,000 items. Half of those are produced by the Pimlico factory and the other half by about six or seven private companies. On the 4th of August 1914, when the war breaks out, Kitchener, within a couple of days, issues his famous call for Kitchener's first 100,000 and soon afterwards calling for another 500,000 volunteers. There's a great deal of enthusiasm, although the recruiting boom doesn't actually start until late August, early September. Kipling's famous poem, For All We Have and Are, For All Our Children's Sake, Stand Up and Take the War, The Honey's at the Gate, was published in the Times on the 2nd of September. And this is when there's a huge surge in recruitment. The problem is that the resources are not there to equip the troops. No facilities to house all these troops or to equip them with weapons. Eventually, the new recruits are going to be billeted on the civilian population for which civilians are paid. They practice with wooden rifles. And then we have the problem of uniforms. When the war breaks out, the uniform stocks of the British Army are very low. 
They are only sufficient to hit out the British Expeditionary Force, six divisions of regular troops, and to resupply them, but not much else. By the end of 1914, a bit over a million men had enlisted in Kitchener's armies, and they need uniforms. Each recruit required two service jackets, two service trousers in khaki serge. They need at least one pair of boots, an army grade coat, several shirts, socks, underwear, hat, putties. In the last year before the war, the number of service jackets produced was 250,000. The demand by mid-November is 5,250,000. One clothing manufacturer calls the new demands for uniform staggering. When it comes to underclothes, I think 11 million woolen drawers are needed, about 6 million pairs of boots. And that's just the new army. In addition, the territorial force army units also need uniforms and boots. They are also recruiting. They are kitted out by the county territorial associations, municipal governments, Various local, voluntary, professional, charitable associations are also raising army units for Kitchener's armies, kitting out their own locally raised units. And then you have the male British Red Cross units which want uniforms. And then from 1915, the Volunteer Training Corps, the Women's Volunteer Reserve. So there's a huge pressure on supplies. There are also economic pressures, basically a shortage of raw materials. You need woolen yarn, which is going to be woven into woolen cloth, which is going to be made up into uniforms. You need buttons. There are not enough buttons in 1914. There is not enough yarn. There is not enough woolen cloth. But the biggest shortage is synthetic khaki dye, which is essential for the khaki uniforms. The world leader in synthetic dyes was Germany. And so most of the synthetic khaki dyes, which the British industries were using to create khaki cloths, they came from Germany. With Germany becoming an enemy country, that's no longer an option. There are sufficient number of British companies which could step in and produce khaki dye to replace these imports. The problem is that most of the production of khaki dye is protected by patents for German companies. So if you want to start producing khaki dye, you have to apply to the Board of Trade to cancel out certain patents of production processes. The British government is quite keen to do everything legally, so it takes a while. So what happens to the fairly cumbersome system of uniform supply of the war office when war breaks out? The previous system produced very good quality at very effective prices. The problem was it was very, very slow. Sometimes it takes five or six weeks before contracts can be awarded. There is no time for that. Initially, the War Office didn't change the system because there are so many other things to do, and they have to find other ways. Late August 1914, at a conference, Kitchener said that as long as men of the same unit were closed in the same fashion, he didn't actually care whether that uniform, at least for training purposes, conformed to the standard patterns. And that's actually followed through. Because there is not enough khaki to go around, the war office managed to get hold of about 500,000 blue woolen suits from the post office and they start issuing that. And because grey-blue is a colour that existed in sufficient quantities, they start putting into production what became known as Kitchener's Blue. The first Kitchener units were issued with blue serge jackets and trousers. This became criticised both at the time and since as a symbol of the shambles. But there was simply no other way. I actually think Kitchener was very pragmatic. There are quite a lot of portrait photos of soldiers posing 
in photographer studios in their Kitchener blue uniforms, which they sent home to their families or exchange with their new comrades. And that to me indicates that the embarrassment or unhappiness of soldiers about the Kitchener's blue uniform was not actually as bad as sometimes we believe it was. In addition to getting these blue uniforms from the post office and starting to produce the Kitchener blue uniforms, the War Office also placed very, very large orders with Canadian and U.S. companies for millions of khaki jackets and trousers and greatcoats, which will be delivered later. For a while, they continue with their pre-war competitive tendering process until that system pretty much breaks down under the weight of the mud. Another point of criticism against the War Office policies of uniform production was that they are continuing to rely on private enterprise and its profit motive instead of adopting more collectivist policies require more companies to produce uniforms for the army at cost prices. I don't think that creating a new centralized authority would have been very useful. In fact, the War Office did the opposite and authorizes local army commands to spend money and get supplies for their units locally. Then the same thing happens with the territorial force units. The county associations are authorized to kit out their units because the War Office simply was unable to do so. Another example of this decentralization policy of the War Office is that late November 1914, there's a realization that the storage and inspection of uniforms, which all happened in the Pimlico factory, needs to be expanded and decentralized. A lot of the textile mills, the woolen and worsted mills, are up in Yorkshire and in Scotland. So they are producing cloth, which is then sent down to London, to Pimlico, to be inspected. And then it's going to be sent up again to Leeds for the big wholesale clothing factories to produce uniforms. From late November, the War Office starts negotiating to open new depots across the country, a new army clothing depot was opened in Leeds. They negotiate with the municipal authorities and they take over a former tramway depot. There's one in Sheffield, in Manchester, in Glasgow, and in London also they open new depots. The one probably a lot of people are familiar with is the Olympia Exhibition Hall, which had been a big site for popular entertainment before the war. From early 1915, it becomes an army clothing factory depot storing massive bales of army uniforms until the end of 1918 or early 1919. So again, decentralization was a good thing because it saves a lot of time. In the case of Leeds, that's one of the first depots to open. All the khaki cloths produced locally by woolen mills is sent to the Leeds depot, inspected, and then dispatched to the clothing manufacturers to turn them into uniforms. The War Office also buys massive stocks of civilian pattern suits, as well as boots of civilian pattern, and issue them to soldiers while they are in training. From October 1914, they develop a service dress uniform and trousers, which simplify certain design elements of the regulation pattern khaki uniform so that it could be produced more quickly. The breast pockets, the top breast pockets on both sides have a pleat. The simplified pattern doesn't have that. Plain buttons are used instead of the Royal Arms buttons, brass buttons. There are fewer pockets on the trousers and the cut of the trousers are different at the back. It's called simplified pattern or utility suit. The War Office wasn't so rigidly wedded to the pre-war standardized patterns. They were actually quite pragmatic. Instead of creating a new authority, a new body, which would centralize all this, they worked through existing networks and organizations There's one more pressure on uniform production, which I haven't mentioned. Allied governments, the French government and the Russian government, are also placing orders with British companies for cloth to produce uniforms, for boots, and for some uniforms. So, for example, the French government is placing orders for cloth to produce greatcoats for the French army, and a very large order for 2 million boots 
or French army pattern. This is with the permission of the British government and a separate commission is created with the help of the Board of Trade to make sure that these foreign orders are not interfering with the orders of the British Army and the Admiral to the British Navy. Kitchener gets wind of this and finds out that the French government was successful in its order to get the cloth and also that one bootmaking company very efficiently produces one million pairs of boots for the French army. The order was placed in around the 15th of August and the first consignment of a million boots is delivered by mid-November. Kitchener finds out which civil servant in the Board of Trade had the French government, uh, U.H. Wintour. A man offers him a job and appoints him as the new director of army contracts which is very significant because it's usually Lloyd George who is given credit for securing a lot of very good civil servants for his Ministry of Munition from May 1915, but Kitchener is actually the first one to do this. Wintour is very efficient. He is one of those who is going to drive the development of new policies from November 1914. Kitchener also finds out which bootmaking company produced those million boots for the French army, and contacts one of the partners in that company, Edward Penton, the very popular and well-liked member of the British bootmaking trade. Kitchener offers him a job to take over the new boot section of the Royal Army Clothing Department, which Penton accepts. Penton is actually going to organise the boot production through his business contacts in the British bootmaking trade. And the third example of how the War Office was working through existing organizations, existing networks, is a conference with leading members of the Wholesale Clothiers Association, which results in an agreement between the War Office, Contracts Department, and the British Wholesale Clothiers Association for organizing uniform production for the army. These new men collaborating with the War Office, Wintour, the new director of the Army Contracts Department, Edward Penton heading the new boot section of the Army Clothing Department, and the British Wholesale Clothiers Association are going to drive these new policies, replacing competitive tendering with collective bargaining, collective agreements. They take on commissions for producing uniforms and boots and distribute the orders among British wholesale clothing factories and bootmaking factories and organize mass production, encouraging factories to expand their capacity, to expand their sites, to invest into new machinery, to take on new people. And that is the system which is going to start producing the khaki uniforms and regulation boots from 1915. By June, July 1915, the khaki shortage is over a recruiting poster which tell that the new recruits signing up for Kitchener's armies will now be kitted out as soon as they enlisted, getting a full khaki kit. That was Dr Christina Robert on the production of Clothing, Uniforms and Boots. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Christopher Phillips about the railways.